Welcome to the discussion series on free trade and liberalization as part of the 1991 project at the Mercatus Center. I'm Shruti Rajagopalan, and in this conversation series, I will be talking trade with Professor Arvind Panagarya, who is the director of the Deepak and Neera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. In the past, he has served as the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog in Government of India and as chief economist of the Asian Development Bank. He's the author of a number of books, but for today's conversation in particular, we will focus on his recent book, Free Trade and Prosperity. Welcome, Arvin. Hi, Shruti. Very pleased to be back with you. Thank you for joining us and talking trade and reforms. I want to talk today uh, about a few aspects of protectionism as a continuation of our conversation last time. So in the last episode, you detailed some of the common arguments against pr- uh, free trade and for protectionism, especially in developing countries. Now, I want to come to one of the most, to me, it's one of the most annoying arguments in favor of protectionism and against free trade. And I am yet to see the economic logic of it, even though I've thought about it for a long time. There seems to be this implicit bias against imports and there is a bias towards exports, right? So everyone wants that we should import nothing and we should keep exporting, right? That's the idea. And this is driven by some, I don't know, some kind of like basic misunderstanding of trade deficits. Uh, This idea that trade deficits are this terrible thing in any economy. It's going to tank the economy. We need to keep trade deficits low and always be in surplus. Uh, So that's one part of the argument. And uh, this keeps coming back. I mean, a very large part of this make in India movement, which is going on right now. I mean, we're 30 years post-liberalization and this arguments come back with a vengeance. So this just doesn't go away. I don't understand the economic logic that supports it or the fascination with it. So what exactly is this argument and what is the merit, if any, why doesn't it just, why isn't this case closed once and for all? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> this, yeah, this, absolutely right. That uh, that this, this uh, I mean, you know. So when you say what is the argument, there is no argument. So <laughs> the answer is difficult to give. But uh, uh, but you know, one can try to explain, you know, why there is not not an argument. Uh, but w- we can also come to come back to why why you know. Um, I think partly, you know, why it keeps coming is that uh, somehow you think that, um, you know, when imports come in, they displace my products, that whatever is imported, I would be producing. Uh, and and uh, so then we can also, this is also the, the sort of fallacy, same fallacy runs through the import substitution argument as well, to which we can come in the last, yeah. at the end, at the end, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, that's the sort of thing going on here. But but to see how fallacious, how uh, uh, wrong that argument is, just think of the two options. Uh, one is that the country can import whatever it needs without having to export anything at all. Right? Yeah. You can all go on vacation, man. You know, just <laughs> let somebody else do the production activity. We all have to do leisure. That would be amazing. It's fantastic. Right? So there's one option. You got the second option where the country kind of uh, uh, sends out exports and receives nothing in return uh, uh, as imports, right? So now you, you can even think, because, because you think that exports are good, imports are bad. So uh, you say, all right, I don't want any imports, but I want to export. Well, put your goods on the ship, let them go halfway into the ocean, dump all the goods there, let them come back. Now. On your books, these have been exported. So your uh, your, uh, your exports would look very, very good. <laughs> but, uh, 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 and you didn't want any imports in return anyway. So what does it matter if the goods got dumped uh, into the ocean? You can see what how foolish that would be. Yeah. And no, no country would actually do that. Um, 
and that's the point that that you know this whole idea somehow that exports are good and imports are bad is is totally cockoid because in the end you want to export so that you can import the whole idea ultimately is 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 to be able to you know export so that you can import it, it's the imports is what you are seeking and and uh, we always say in a trade in trade we say that you know if 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 you get a higher price for your exports which will mean that for any given amount of exports you get more imports yeah that's better that's an improvement yeah. in your terms of trade yeah that's an, you know i mean it's like i work for colombia and if it colombia raises my salary that's you a good thing more. for me it's not a bad thing you know i want more you know and and then i can spend more uh it's the same thing that you know if if we can get a higher price for our exports then we will be able to import more for that money uh for those dollars that we get in return so you know milton friedman you know once famously said in uh, i don't think he wrote it out but some in speech you know that one this video exists somewhere and and i remember uh, uh, watching it he said that look you know uh, 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 exports one cent are gone um, uh, we can't eat but imports we can eat so he said we can't eat exports because they're gone but we can eat imports so you know once gone they can neither be consumed nor used to produce any other products yeah. uh, but imports allow you to produce other products or it can be directly consumed so that's that part you know somehow this notion of exports are good and imports are not it's is totally wrong i mean is this because we used to have terrible capital controls so the foreign exchange problem was really bad which means the only way you could import anything was if you earned foreign exchange so they tried to reduce the number of people who were spending foreign exchange and therefore encouraging people who were own earning foreign exchange in the indian context that seems to be the only sort of like you know recent logic i can trace it's very illogical it's a bad autarkic system of a closed economy but that's the only place i can even understand why someone would suggest something like this on every other margin i simply don't get it but i have a few more specific questions here so the first is you gave this wonderful example of yourself right you are earning uh, you are in a perpetual trade surplus uh with colombia right you sell them your services you buy very few services from colombia right. and you're in a perpetual trade deficit uh you know with west side market or fairway which is the grocery store in your neighborhood right, right? uh and because you are constantly buying things from there every single day now this is not a problem for you at all in fact the larger your trade deficits with restaurants and grocery stores in a way the happier you are because you're able to buy more uh why does this seem so logical at the individual level but completely loses the plot at the country level why are we talking about trade surpluses and deficits at the nationwide level that yeah, part of the know, argument i don't understand right right so so now you are actually talking not about the aggregate trade deficit or surplus yeah. but you're talking about the bilateral ones bilateral right? so, ones so, yeah. so so you switched to to the bilateral ones yeah um before i come to that you know something you said earlier i just want to comment um, about you know how this uh, in the indian context uh, uh, love for exports and hate for imports arose right? but if you dig a little deeper uh, uh it, it is precisely because you are wanting to import that you want to export i mean yeah. they, you know they, they were encouraging more and more exports because it, it was inability to import right uh, so uh, so somehow uh, you know anybody translating that to 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 uh, the, oh exports are good imports are bad i mean you're right actually in, in literal sense you are absolutely right that 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 that's how it is sort of drilled into the citizenry yeah but 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 it is really actually the deep down it's uh, it's being drilled down because of the fact that you know you really desperately want to be able to import <laughs> uh, because you know even your normal production capacity doesn't uh, get fully used yeah uh, because you're not able to import certain raw materials inputs components etc uh, and so there was always excess capacity in production in india during the, the 70s and 80s 
uh, because of the trade constraint. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, but the, it was not because imports were bad. Imports were incredibly valuable. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, right. So, so that. So now so come to the the bilateral versus aggregate. You are not in an aggregate trade deficit, right? But you are in bilateral trade deficits quite frequently, depending on who your trading partner is. Right. Uh, we don't seem to translate this individual logic that I just explained in your specific case. Uh, we translate it in a very bizarre way at the country-wide level, right? We want to reduce our imports from China, seems to be the latest clarion call. So can you just walk us through what is going on here? like, And why is this a terrible argument? It's so harmful uh, to have this bias against imports because imports, buying components, buying cheap technology, having access to, you know, global uh, production technology uh, is what enables us to be happier consumers, but also better, more efficient producers, because it'll be an input in our output. So actually import bias, I find very harmful uh, for the economy overall. So can you just put this in context for us? Because I just don't understand this. So so, so I I think... Things are getting mixed up here. You see, what happens is that uh, a specific case of India-China, yeah. even perhaps what I'm going to say applies to the US-China because US-China has the same deficit problem with China. Um, now, well, first, actually, track back a little bit before I come to this argument. The First of all, at the aggregate level, you do care about the deficit because yeah. that's largely what defines your current account deficit. Yeah. And, and you don't want overly large current account deficit because uh, that would mean that you're accumulating foreign debt uh, uh, at a very fast yeah. pace, uh, which can, uh, if not, uh, uh, you know, if your foreign exchange reserves are not good, if your exports are not vibrant, uh, somewhere can create a crisis, you know, I mean, there's a kind of 1991 cri- balance of payments yeah. crisis we have had. So, so, but nowadays, you know, after the 91 crisis, this Reserve Bank of India has been very cautious and we have yeah. accumulated vast amount of reserves and all. Yeah. And it runs the current account quite conservatively. You know, anytime it goes beyond 2%, current account deficit goes yeah. beyond 2%, the RBI really kind of begins to worry about the exchange rate and all. So yeah. aggregate is fine, right? So, so therefore, the issue is only the bilateral one. Yeah. First of all, why this is happening? Certainly, one part of this, uh, you know, um, uh, the analogy of my personal life, you know, to, uh, of surplus uh, with Columbia University and uh, deficit uh, with everybody else is, is clearly applicable to the countries as well. First of all, okay, which is and because you know, I mean, the whole idea of trade is that you buy your goods uh, from the country that sells you the cheapest. And you sell your goods to the countries that give you the highest price for your goods. Yeah. That's how you do it. And it and it is going to be a hell of a coincidence that uh, uh, the country that sells you the cheapest also gives you the highest price for your goods. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, they will be different. Yeah. Uh, you know. So uh, so so uh, therefore, you would run surplus with somebody, and you'll run deficit with somebody. Yeah. And the central bank RBI will ensure that on aggregate, your deficit is contained to a couple of percentage points yeah. uh, of the GDP. Uh, so uh, if, uh, there is an optical illusion here, obviously, that you know uh, you are complaining about the fisc- uh, about the bilateral deficit with China, but you are not complaining about the uh, you are not seeing the fact that you have, you got a bilateral surplus with the United States. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you actually actively try to reduce your trade with China, your exports, your surplus with the United States will also fall. I mean, at the end of the day, RBI is going to worry about that, keep it to 1% to 2% of the GDP. So that's not going to, aggregate deficit is not going to change. If you reduce imports, your exports will ultimately somewhere get impacted. Yeah. So that, But that we don't, don't see. Now, I think part of the political issue here is that um, uh, there is a lot of protectionism is embedded in, in this. That you see, if the United States is having too many ex- imports from China, India is having too many imports from China, um, you know, those who are producing import competing goods, they see that uh, this is an opportunity to, you know, 
Yeah. Seek some protection against this. So that, that you know, if everybody, if these large countries are importing so much from China without uh, exporting them, something is wrong. Wrong in China. Yeah. It, you know, so it's it's a it's it's the vested interest in the import competing sectors which would make the greatest noise. That China is dumping. Yeah. That they are dumping these products on us. Uh, they would not, you know, and and then you know, nobody this existence of subsidies etc. is very hard to verify. Uh, uh, and China, in any case, is also, you know, after all, it's a, a communist country. So you make these allegations, oh, they are subsidizing their exports and all, and this is how they are uh, competitive and etc., uh, etc. Et uh, but of course, you know, if the subsidy was the really reason, then you could have challenged them in the WTO, those, uh, you know, any kind of uh, output or export subsidies that impact trade uh, 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 are challengeable in the WTO. But we are not doing that. No, but even yeah, more same. basically, if the Chinese government is subsidizing my T-shirts sitting in India, I am not too upset about that. No, no, that's a separate point. That's a separate point. But that's not that's not the producer. That's not what the producer. No, that's is. not a producer concern. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the producers couched it as dumping. What is in fact very well and competitively priced goods. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that China is exporting that to the United States and to India because they are much more competitive in these yeah. products. I mean, that's the point. But but when there is this very large volume of imports coming from one country yeah. into India and into the United States also, then you say, ah, oh, there is something wrong in the, in the Chinese economy, that they are doing something, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, unlawful. Uh, and so that becomes the, uh, you know, then you start focusing. No, that's one part of the story. The other part of the story, of course, is that uh, um, uh, any country seeking concession with a country, trade concessions with a country that is exporting a lot to it, is in a good position. I think it gives yeah. you a handle. Is it? It gives you a handle that hey, I'm importing so much from you, but I'm not allowed. I'm not being able to export. Something is wrong in your system. Fix it. I mean, that's what the United States says. It, you know, they, they even start fixing the actual uh, quantitative targets that, you know, exp- uh, this is like the voluntary export, rest- uh, uh, yeah. you know, voluntary sort of uh, uh, in- incentives to, to import more from the United States. Yeah. Right? No, and also other aspects which are not trade related, like intellectual property and things like that. You also have better position to negotiate other things you may want, right. human right. rights right. or, right. Uh, you know, better safety codes and, you know, treatment right. of workers right. or intellectual property when you're a very large importer from one single country. Right, right. So, so, so what do you, I mean, so, so to some degree, this bilateral deficit gives you a handle. Yeah. That part is okay. <laughs> you know, so if, if India wants to use this, it's leverage. Uh, of of this la- large trade deficit with China to get some concessions out of China, uh, that's okay. I think you know the countries do that. Uh, 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 that's a strategic. That's a more strategic uh, uh, move and 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 uh, taking advantage of it. Uh, but but as far as economics of it is concerned, beyond the strategic advantage you want to exercise. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong at all with the uh, bilateral deficits with one set of countries and bilateral surpluses with another set of countries. No, but Arvind, why is the unit of analysis always the producer and not the consumer, right? This is a very big problem I have uh, when we talk about this bias against imports. So the bias against imports is really only talking about two out of three parties, right? One party that it's talking about is the producer. The second party it's talking about is the exchequer because they are, they want, you know, larger uh, revenues that come in if there are higher tariffs, right? Uh, There are very few producers usually in any economy, the very large number of consumers and this import bias enormously disadvantages consumers, right? So if you have 20% tariffs on cheap Android Chinese phones, it's going to really impact Indian consumers and it's going to impact the poorest consumers the most. And this just seems to be missing from the overall 
discussion, right? Usually the arguments that economists like you and I give is, yeah, it's going to disadvantage this group of producers, but you know, cheaper inputs means that other producers have cheaper components and cheaper inputs and they can be more productive. But what about the consumer? Yeah, no, That's no, all no. of us. Trade, 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 trade economists always actually take the side of consumers. I would contest that. That's what we <laughs> do. Uh, uh, in fact, trade economists are the only uh, 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 players in the game who appoint themselves actually to speak for the consumer. No, uh, I don't just mean trade economy. I meant, sorry, I should have been, I should clarify. I meant the people who are peddling this import yeah, but, but, uh, but that bias. Is, yeah. Yeah, I mean that is that is that goes back to the political economy of it. That you know, producers are better organized, uh, consumers are almost unorganized completely. Yeah. Uh, so, so therefore, the consumer interests are not represented. Uh, um, you know, otherwise, I think uh, I've probably said this before. Uh, Henry George wrote it the best. You know, he said that look, you know, uh, we are calling this protection. But who are we protecting here? The buyer wants to buy it. The seller wants to sell, you know, and then the government steps in, says, I'm not going to let you buy. Who is being protected here? The yeah. seller is, is not being protected. The buyer is not being protected. What, how is this protection? You know, yeah. so, so, uh, uh, so, but but this is the age old, old problem, you know, that the, the, the fact that in the political process, consumers, producers are always uh, much more dominant players than the consumers are. Um, so, so which is why, as I said, you know, the, the, the trade economists are the self-appointed representatives of the consumers and they uh, are the ones who go and play for. Um, you know, now a very good example on in the Indian context, which also somewhere I may have said before, but uh, is, is the mobile revolution that took yeah. place in India during the 2000s, you know, yeah. uh, if, if, if India had a high uh, protection, high de- degree of protection, uh, that mobile revolution, you know, which within happened. a span of eight or ten years produced a billion mobile phones in the hands of the uh, Indian uh, uh, citizens, uh, would have never happened. Would have never happened. So, so in that case, it's 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 very visible, very visible. Uh, and and certainly, you know, the protectionism we are doing right now for uh, against the smartphone, for example. That would impact the access to the smartphones, you know. So many people who would buy low-end smartphones would uh, stay for a while with the feature phones. But you know, even more basically, uh, the 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 import bias being more about the producer than anyone else. A few years ago, I was in Mumbai. Uh, during the Ganpati festival, right? And, you know, there is a a demand shock for Ganpati idols during that time because every uh, home will get one and then they will, of course, dissolve it, uh, you know, in the sea. And that's the ritual. Uh, I Everywhere you go in Mumbai, shops will have these Ganpati idols. And that year, I asked them, who is making these? And they said, ma'am, they're all imported from China, right? Uh, The Chinese entrepreneur is aware of this highly local cultural festival, is able to make these idols that can actually satisfy human taste, is able to do it better and cheaper. uh, And most Mumbai families at this point apparently have access to a Ganpati that is produced in China, right? Uh, To me, this doesn't seem, there was some outrage over it while I was there. Uh, But to me, this doesn't seem like it's hurting anybody, right? Like in general, one would assume that the more families who could be, who could afford a Ganpati idol, simply to dissolve in the sea a few weeks later, uh, the better. If it's too expensive, fewer families might be able to engage in it. So this is the sort of, you know, thing that I I always think about uh, as an example where if the importing, uh, sorry, the exporting country from which India is importing can actually make something so culturally specific, better and cheaper, uh, then perhaps we should let them do it. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that nobody is hurting, right? Because the producers of uh, who could produce otherwise those idols 
uh, are the ones who are hurting, right? I mean, so it's again goes back to the producer interests. Uh, consumer interests are better served, obviously, by the imports. I mean, it's not limited to the Ganpati statues. There are rakhis, there are Everything. kites, you know, patang, yeah. you know, the, all this, which are all cultural products. Uh, but uh, they, 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 but we have to sit back, you know, rather than slap uh, these uh, anti-dumping duties, etc., on uh, the. Uh, on the import from China, we need to sit back and say, what are we doing wrong and that, that that this is happening? You know, why are our producers not able to compete? Yeah, I mean, what to, where is the bottom? What are the relevant you know? constraints that but, we can't but, you know, produce moment, at scale and yeah, produce so the, cheap? The, 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 the moment you say, okay, I'll provide protection, then basically you 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 have uh, uh, you know. Uh, said ki, okay you know you have a handicap but live with the handicap i will just uh, uh, you know smooth out uh, uh, the 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 highway for you by uh, simply not letting anybody else enter on the roads now related to bias against imports but a separate argument in itself is import substitution right this is the big one when it comes to trade protectionism for developing countries and import substitution policies were you know absolutely the mainstream prescription especially post world war 2 for developing countries so you know free trade is a luxury that only developed economies can engage in and afford and developing countries must have import uh, you know, substitution policies. And this was sort of the idea. Now, what is the reason that this became the orthodoxy post-World War II? And now you are seeing import substitution arguments return, right? Anytime there's a crisis like the global financial crisis or now the COVID pandemic crisis, import substitution just comes back in a big way in all the arguments, you know, in policy circles and newspapers and so on. So can you tell us a little bit about the original argument as a prescription for developing countries in the 50s and 60s? And is there any merit in returning to import substitution policies as India is attempting to do now? Okay, so yeah, you're absolutely right. This is uh, this is a very uh, um, uh, omnipresent kind of uh, issue, you know, uh, historically or contemporarily, wherever you look, you know, this in one form or the other, it keeps coming back. Um, um, now, you know, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the older argument was, as, as I discussed, early, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, resulted from some this export pessimism, yeah. that the primary products is what these countries will export and, you know, but that argument is now out of the window because uh, the, the Koreans and Taiwanese showed us that, you know, uh, you, you, you can export manufacturing products, the labor intensive manufacturing products yeah. uh, from the beginning. You, yeah. you don't have to. And there is no uh, elasticity pessimism issue associated with that. So, so that was primarily academically, at least you know, India's context was very different, which we'll come to in some future yeah. episode. Right. You know, so, so I'll not touch on Indian uh, context, which was, which is, which is actually quite dramatically different. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, the, the arguments that, that, I mean, why, why this has such a, such an appeal. Uh, one is, of course, that, you know, when you're importing something, demand is certain that it's there. Uh, you know, when, for example, even today, when smartphones are being imported or feature phones are being imported, you know that there is domestic demand for it. And so there is no uncertainty, anything, you know, exports, you know, you don't know where, who is going to buy this, that, but here, you know, that you got your buyers here. Uh, and, and so that makes import substitution attractive, okay, you know, why are we importing? We can produce it at home. So it also coincides nicely with the nationalistic kind of, you know, that uh, why are we, I mean, <laughs> the examples you mentioned, Ganesha statues or things like Rakis, etc., yeah. even more kind of in that direction that, you know, these are our cultural goods, you know, why should we? So, so there is that demand certainty, uh, which, which, which is very important. Also, I think, you know, ministries like to demonstrate success. Yeah. And, what is the easiest thing to do to demonstrate success? Well, if demand is there, you know, just keep out the export, keep out the imports. Um, you can easily demonstrate success. 
I mean, you know, even in the Indian context, I remember, I'm sure you also must have noticed that uh, uh, our previous uh, minister uh, uh, for the for IT, uh, uh, Ravi Shankar Prasad, you know, uh, loved to go out and say that, look, you know, uh, I, I have created these new 200 menu or some very large number of manufacturers of mobile phones, yeah. right? So that was, a, he would sell it as a huge success, uh, you know, but I've never heard anybody, you know, uh, 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 bragging about uh, export success that they have produced yeah. in the Indian context. I can't, I can't think of one, anyone where you, you would say, you know, uh, export successes are not claimed by the policy guys. <laughs> you see, the export successes are, I mean, our IT, you know, software, very early success that happened, right? It was not the success that even the government said that we actually created that success. I'm sure government played some role somewhere. But uh, but largely, we always see that as, you know, success of the entrepreneurs, etc. But import successes, we all claim, you know, auto industry, we make a claim, you know, because we because we provide the, provide the protection. So for ministries, it's a great thing, right? Also, uh, uh, it, it finds traction politically because the damage that import substitution does, uh, and this is, you know, old point made by Frederick Bastiat, uh, you know, where he said that uh, the good that protection does is uh, uh, apparent to the naked eye, but the harm it does uh, is spread throughout the economy and it can be seen only by an expert eye. Yeah. And and so, you know, this reduced exports, which inevitably ha- happens Excellent. when you reduce imports, uh, is too indirect for others to detect. So you only see the benefit side of it. You don't see the cost side of it. And in fact, the cost side is, is higher than the benefit side and therefore cost benefit analysis is against import substitution. But you just don't see the cost side. And, and so that also makes the import substitution more attractive. And uh, <laughs> among the politicians is also this belief that they can simultaneously reduce imports and, and expand exports. Is also then this also gets ties into you know imports are bad and exports are good etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know we all know if you look at the data that you know there's no country that has you know the, uh, reduced imports and did not reduce exports. Uh, yeah. I mean in some particular year it may happen, but uh, if you look at the long term trends, yeah. export and import series move together. Take any time period, yeah. any country, you know. This is a kind of practically practically iron-clad yeah. role. And the flip is also true. The more you export, the more you must import. Import, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes say that, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, if you compare India and China, for example, uh, uh, in, in the 2000s and later, uh, you know, India's export response was, was much uh, weaker than the export response that is happening in, the, in, in, in China. I yeah. often said this, that, look, you know, part of India's problem is that the import response has been very muted. Yeah. That when we open to trade, right, we went from complete prohibition on trade, almost, I mean, you effectively, know. Effectively, yeah. Uh, effectively, right, you know, prohibitive barriers to relatively open, right, by 2007-8, the top tariff rate had come down to 10% with some yeah. exceptions. And yet imports didn't expand as much. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'd expand. And if had the exports imports expanded, simultaneously exports would have expanded as well. Yeah. So, so I often attribute actually the the muted export performance to to muted, muted import, import response. Import yeah. response. So, uh, so, but but these are the factors you know, which which uh, 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 explain why the import substitution remains an attractive thing. And even you know people who otherwise believe in trade often you know fall for it they yeah. fall for it you know uh, and uh, uh, now historically if you look at it you know what is currently happening in india is to some degree uh, 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 similar to what happened in the 1970s in south korea yeah right you know the economy grew imports grew because exports grew imports grew and by 1973 imports had become large enough that the policy makers said that yeah we can produce these things at home why are we importing? And with us, it has similar thing has happened now that, you know, imports did grow, right? I mean, uh, at, at peak, imports had become about almost 30% of the GDP compared with 10% in 91. Yeah. 
And so policymaker thinks that, oh, this is a large amount. Why am I importing? I can produce them at home. Yeah. And, and they also think that this is a net addition to GDP, whatever I do, because they don't see the negative effect yeah. that simultaneously happens on exports. And that is the problem. So they just think that by adding this, I am actually adding to the GDP. There is no subtraction happening. It's only addition that is happening. And it's and that confuse, kind of... And they confuse the political entity with an economic entity, right? Uh, the economic process is global. It's deeply intricate, right? It's highly decentralized. Who is producing what? How they are competing on price? How there's a new producer, an entrepreneur in a new country who might suddenly provide you something cheaper, but the national entities remain the same. Yeah. So the way the policymakers think about it is us versus them in a, in a country sense without thinking about producers and consumers as just, you know, individual firms or individual entrepreneurs who might be doing a very intricate global social cooperation in some sense. Right, 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 right. But, you know, now there is another sort of fallacy that goes, you know, which, which enhances this import substitution. Uh, and, and, and that is not understanding the, 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 the massive protection they, uh, of uh, import substitution of finance are providing. And, and so let's take this example. You know, this goes back to, you know, our old idea of the effective rate of protection uh, as opposed to the nominal rate of protection. Yeah. And so, so I want to take a little example and explain, you know, exactly how this, this kind of uh, 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 um, th th this protection gets so understated, actually, when you look at the tariff rates. Right. So think of the mobile smartphone, you know, some um, smartphone. Let's, for simplicity, think of this. Uh, that it costs hundred dollars to import it, right? Uh, and the smartphone uh, sort of uh, uh, is made of about uh, large number of components, uh, which uh, uh, account for about ninety dollars part of its cost. So you can, uh, if you import this, so under free trade, let's say if you import smartphone, you can get it for hundred dollars. Uh, and components themselves, if you were to import only components, they will cost ninety dollars. So then any local manufacturer who can assemble the components for $10 or less can effectively compete with the imported smartphones, right? Uh, so, so there is this margin of over $10 for assembly per smartphone that uh, 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 is available to those and anybody who can carry out that activity can compete. Now, suppose the government says that, well, you know, there are all these massive large number of smartphones being imported. Uh, why can't we manufacture them at home? Uh, yeah. So let's give some modest protection to the domestic producers and say, we'll give, you know, we'll impose a 10% custom duty on the imports of smartphones. Right? So it, it may look like, okay, 20, 12, 20% uh, is not such a big deal, you know, and all. But just think what happens. Now, the price of the imported smartphone has gone up to $120. Yeah. Components can still be imported at 90. Yeah. So the margin between the 120 and 90 has now gone up to $30. Yeah. So now previously under free trade, you had to be so efficient as to assemble the smartphone in just $10 per unit of cost. Yeah. Now you can do up to $30. Yeah. Right. So the protection is not 20%. Protection on That's assembly so activity is 200%. <laughs> it's a 200% protection. Yeah. And so you are encouraging massive inefficiency here. That anybody, you know, so no, it's no surprise that when you do this kind of tariff, a uh, uh, very large number of manufacturers come in. Yeah. You know, anybody, I mean, look, you know, even you and I could sit down and assemble a smartphone for that kind of margin, right? You yeah. know, you got a 200% uh, advantage over the, uh, the best competitor. So, and, 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 and so you are not going to get these uh, super uh, efficient and super productive assembly manufacturers. You're going to end up with actually all these in inefficient guys, you know, who think that as long as the protection remains, we can survive. Yeah. 
and and so this is the damage, right? And now that's the one that's the one problem, right? <laughs> but it compounds because so the mobile industry becomes uh, uh, vibrant. It comes in and all, and then at that process, the, the politician has, and, and the government uh, bureaucrats, all of them have to look. You know, we created a mobile industry that hardly existed. We have done it. And so now we have to increase this success. So now, which means that let's have more value added. So let's, you know, extend protection to maybe half of these components. Yeah. Right. So, so you say, well, I'm just taking an example. So you take half of the components, you say, slap a 50, 20% duty on the, these components. Now the... 10% duty on those components uh, uh, ends up uh, adding uh, 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 for, uh, about what uh, $4.50 to the cost. Yeah. So what was importable for $90 now becomes $94.50. Yeah. Well, I've cut the, uh, uh, no, sorry, it's 20% duty, right? So it's, it's $9. Yeah. It's $9 uh, of, of duty. So from 90, you go to $99. Yeah. Well, 99 and 120, the gap is now reduced to $21. Yeah. Now, what will happen to all those assembly uh, 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 fly-by-night assembly manufacturers who, whose cost was between $21 to $30 per mobile phone? They are all gone. Yeah. Either that or you increase the uh, uh, protection to the, the final mobile. Uh, Usually imports. the latter because they lobby for it. Well, so so and 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 you know, once you are man, becoming a manufacturer, you lobby, you become more or you know you'll create unemployment, right? I mean that if you if, if you don't do that, then you'll create unemployment. So the government is also uh, sympathy is okay. I'll twenty uh, percent will go to thirty percent. So this cascading happens. Yeah. And then more more components are protected, more protection at the top level at at, at the final stage. So yeah. either it's cascading or so you are really. Adding all, all these costs. Now, very, I mean, this, this obsession also with value added per unit yes. is, is, is so misplaced, right? So misplaced because now if you do this, this kind of protectionism and, and increase the value added, you think that final assembly, a finally assembled smartphone will be competitive? Yeah. I mean, even here, uh, you will have to, you know, raise that, that tariff rate just to uh, uh, offset the impact of this twenty percent duty on uh, half of the component imports by nine percentage points. So twenty yeah. percent will have to go to twenty nine percent. So the mobile phone, your domestic guy is, is producing mobile phone at one hundred twenty nine dollars. And then if the other components are also done, then uh, you, you have to rate it, put another 9% and so it goes to, to 38% and so $138. Who is going to buy in the global marketplace, you know, what is available for $100 for no 138 You'll never capture the global marketplace. You're never going to do that. So this obsession with high value added per unit is so misplaced yeah. because anybody... Anybody can manufacture, you know, entire 100% value-added product uh, of anything. You can produce an aeroplane, you know, 100% domestic value-added. But it's only the captive buyers at home yeah. who, who can buy it. You'll never capture the global marketplace. You've just described the Indian auto industry. Start to finish. It is exactly, you know, so they can't, so this is why the 1%, uh, they hardly have even 1% share in the uh, uh, global marketplace. My favorite example here is, particularly with respect to this, this, uh, uh, this obsession with value added per unit. I mean, look at China, now iPhone, supposedly 1600 different parts to it. Current supply chains are spread over about 200 different firms, which are spread over 43 different countries. Yeah. And now China has total value added in its iPhone of about 10%. Yeah. But it's 100 million plus iPhones. Yeah. That's a lot of total value added. Yeah. 
Now, if you if you can produce the hundred uh, percent uh, uh, mobile phone uh, smartphone in India, uh, all parts, components, everything homemade, but how many buyers are you going to get? Not many. So your total value added is constrained by your total market uh, domestic market, which is also domestic market at that very high price. Yeah. Uh, you know, even domestic price at hundred thirty eight dollars for a hundred dollar smartphone will shrink. Yeah. Uh, and you'll never get the global marketplace. So, you know, what did you achieve? Total value added, along total value added, you lost out whatever you gained on per unit value added. Yeah. Now, this problem actually has is now become much more serious than it was perhaps, uh, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Because the transportation costs were high. Yeah. Right? So you had a comparative advantage in, let's say, clothing. And so, you know, you, you could have the entire, you know, in, in, uh, including fabric or including uh, uh, fiber, etc. Maybe you could produce because, you know, the crisscrossing, you know, that uh, 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 importing fiber or importing fabric, etc. will add to your cost because transportation costs are so high. Yeah. But today, transportation costs have really plummeted. And and so and, and and then production processes have become more complex also. Yeah. But at the same time, it has also become much easier to break up the production process into many more. Pro- I mean, yeah. this breakup existed before, and you gave the Adam Smith example of the, uh, you know, making a needle, etc. Uh, so it, this specialization along different parts of the existed before, but today it's much more. And so the, the, this this breakability of the of the production process put together with uh, the very low transport costs has meant that the suppliers have got much more spread out. Each activity is undertaken by the one who can do it the best, and that one takes most of the global market. Yeah. So so you so you don't work on value added per unit. But you 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 act on total value added, yeah. even if it's in very small number of components. That is what you need to do. So if you know today India's uh, comparative advantage largely lies in labor intensive activities, then yeah. capture all the assembly activities, for example, yeah. or capture you know some very labor intensive things that that can be maybe services, whatever it is. Yeah, shoelaces. And right? get shoelaces the shoelaces is labor intensive. Yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 and spread it and, and take, out, take over the entire global marketplace. Yeah. Rather than, you know, doing everything more value-added. Yeah. Now, whether it's true, I've not verified, but like our PLI scheme, the, the production link incentive scheme, at least somebody was telling me, so I have to check this, but if it is true, then it is really fatal. Because they're saying that you get this incentive if you produce 80% of the value added domestically, that's a surefire recipe that this, yeah. uh, anybody who takes advantage of that subsidy is not going to be competitive in the global marketplace. Yeah. I mean, it's a double whammy, you know. It bad, is a double bad, whammy. Because for, for, for the country, because uh, also the subsidies in many cases is being provided for highly capital intensive yeah. industries. <laughs> so if you do find some takers, what you are doing is you are massively kind of moving capital, yeah, which is a very scarce factor, yeah, into relative to labor, capital, yeah, into these highly capital intensive sectors, which will create no jobs. Yeah, <coughs> no, actually, there is more. I think it's triple whammy, right? So you're providing these subsidies at the cost to the taxpayer. So that's, that's right. one problem. That's true, true. Yeah. Uh, the second is the Indian consumer pays far more for a car or something that has similar protection, then they would pay uh, if they imported that car or compared to the global consumer. And the third is the Indian manufacturer has been completely coddled into becoming not competitive and is not able to export uh, in the global market, right? So it's multiple whammies. It's not just double whammies. And the scarce capital being- And the scarce capital. Right, being utilized. So there's so many distortions uh, that are being created. This is actually an incredibly, incredibly helpful exposition on the import yeah. substitution. So this is like, you know, so one, one. I mean, th- th- there is something in India 
called Phased Manufacturing Program, yeah. PMP. Yes. It is a favorite of our bureaucrats, you know. <laughs> yes. And, and this, this created massive problems. You know, I gave you earlier that tube light pro, uh, example. That was exactly the phased manufacturing program that will give you license to produce, uh, provided after four years, you also source the uh, components that go into tube light for, from home, yeah. from domestic suppliers. So this is the PMP. And it didn't succeed at all. Actually, and what happened was that the quality of those uh, 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 domestic tube lights only went down because, you know, the local guys, the, the whatever um, uh, quality man, uh, parts they manufactured, the fellows had to buy. And so, therefore, the quality of the tube lights that were manufactured was very poor also. Uh, uh, so, so, there are multiple failures of that program that happened, but that has been not resurrected. Yeah. You know, you can hear Piyush Goel talking about phase manufacturing program. You could previously, uh, uh, I remember the Hasmuk Adhya, who was the uh, yeah. revenue secretary, was talking about this phase manufacturing program as if, you know, 20 years, 30 years passed and we are completely uh, <laughs> uh, were asleep and suddenly woke up and said, oh, we have to do phase manufacturing program again. It's 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 tragic. I mean, if you're at it one really level, is. if one thinks, you know. no, and it keeps coming back. This is actually by I can't even imagine how frustrated you are having worked on trade your entire career. But for me, each time I read these arguments in popular press or you know when ministers are talking about it. I just, I, I just feel so like frustrated and annoyed because it feels like this is settled. We understand this as economists, but we haven't managed to communicate this, uh, you know, more generally. And of course, there are all these political economy issues of consumers not being able to collectivize and organize and producers being able to do that and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, no, and frustration, let me say, no frustration here because, you know, there, there are so few of us who are making that case and yet we have succeeded ultimately. So it's not so bad, you know, we did actually score pretty good success. It also know. means our jobs are not uh, going to be uh, obsolete or substituted anytime in the near <laughs> no, that's future. That's true, you know, I mean, yeah, for, for sure, you know, that if protectionism doesn't go away, then trade economies will not have to go away either. That's true. But but I think, you know, the, uh, uh, one needs to see some successes happening. And, and I think, yeah. you know, we have scored quite a bit of success, actually. Yeah. And, you know, the I mean, the, these the, these these reversals do happen, will happen, yeah. and all. But yeah. uh, and sometimes you know you get a big win, which which cuts through the seen and the unseen problem. You know, yeah. like the Big Bang liberalization that happened in 1991. Yeah. You can really see everybody can see the benefits of that kind of opening right. up. Right. So there are these nice wins right. that sometimes become very seen and right. can, you know, help propel other arguments. Right, but not um, just 91, you know. Right, right continue. Now, so yeah. right now, you know, the uh, very similar, actually, very similar self, I mean, mutually reinforcing, I, I say the... Uh, the insolvency in bankruptcy code, uh, the GST, uh, third year labor law reforms, and fourth year corporate profit tax knocked down to 17% for new manufacturers and uh, to 25% for the rest. These are very mutually reinforcing reforms. Uh, you know, it could be really, uh, 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 the, the benefit could be multiplied yet more if, if we also worked on trade side, because yeah. And yes, also streamline those reforms, trade, right? Yes, GST can yeah. be streamlined no, but that's, so that's much happening. more. Look, yeah. look, that's happening. That's happening. A uh, lot of IBC also needs to be some streamlining and all. But that's a constant. The whole this is a big thing has happened. There will be bumps on the road. You have to clean those up. I mean, GST the bumps, for example, have been cleaned up, which is why you're seeing this massive expansion in tax revenues. Yeah. The, 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 the GST platform was, was working very poorly earlier. But that that has been sorted out, and and now and uh, people like you know the public finance experts go in the row. Uh, uh, he says that you know this GST revenue will go up a lot more. Yeah, so, I actually so. think the revenues will go up the more we simplify the GST structure. You know this rate proliferation that has no, taken that place happen. for but, various but, political economy reasons. I think that needs to you know really 
come back down i recently no, wrote a paper happen. there is also yeah. outstanding issue issue of bringing the the uh, petroleum products into the gst as yes. well and also but look you know i mean india is a very difficult country and today of course you know we have seen that that uh, prime minister modi had to finally to back down on the farm law reforms uh, he says they agreed to to repeal them Uh, yeah, so the reforms don't have a linear path so, they go yeah, so it's not linear in fits so, so, bumps, and yeah. so i want to move on next to this idea of coordination externalities right this is one more externality argument in favor of protectionism uh, if i understand it correctly this is basically rosenstein and rodan's work uh, this is mostly in eastern europe but it argues that the government needs to engineer production of many items simultaneously rather than focusing on a single item and here there's a question of externalities that can propel processes not just the goods right so this is the rough model of course this is in the context of erstwhile soviet union and then transition economies some of these models uh what is this coordination externality argument and does it have any merit for uh, having any kind of trade protectionism so uh, shruti you know uh, 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 this is one argument uh, where there is absolutely no no validity to it uh, for protection okay. there may be validity conceptually uh, uh, for some kind of intervention but for protection it is zero validity and 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 it's very simple i'll tell you take take a very very simple example right? it's a very simple example that um, you need to 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 brush your teeth you need brush and you need toothpaste uh, now suppose i can uh, make a toothbrush but uh, it will sell only if you produce uh, toothpaste if if you don't produce toothpaste then my brush is no good uh but of course you, if you produce toothpaste and i don't produce toothbrush then your production is uh, of of toothpaste is no good it's not going to get anything so there is a coordination failure problem and if the government steps in and and incentivizes each of us to 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 produce it uh, uh promises that if you you uh, if you incur any losses i will recover uh, i will uh, uh, cover all your losses Uh, then each of us produces and there are no losses that are happening and the government really actually doesn't have to spend any money on uh, 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 covering either your losses or mine and the problem is solved right but now think about the possibility of international yeah. trade if 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 i if toothpaste can be imported i don't need any coordination uh, uh, i i can go ahead go ahead happily produce toothbrush and uh, toothpaste will be imported and uh, problem is solved yeah. so in fact protection will precisely be the wrong thing to do in this case because it it it, it is going to hamper uh, it, it will in fact what can be coordinated internationally will fall out of coordination so 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 that argument was actually you know when originally rosenstein rodan made it was entirely in the context of a closed economy yeah uh, and 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 uh, uh, to apply it in an open economy is actually completely the, the wrong argument you know so so the, so this argument uh, I, i mean danny rodrick again here is the one leading the charge and he makes this argument in the context of south korea and taiwan and all that this that that coordination problem is what uh that uh, the taiwanese and uh, south korean government solved in the 60s and 70s now first of all you know on on I, 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 for that he has to really assume that there are certain activities that required coordination uh, uh that were non traded that yeah. uh, that they simply trade was not not possible uh, all right uh, so so certainly then it can't be an argument for protection because if if you're assuming that the product itself is completely non traded which is the only context in which coordination failure can happen uh, uh um, then it's uh, it's not a trade issue in the first place so the protection it certainly it may be argument for any kind of other intervention it cannot be an argument for protection uh, coordination in fact trade actually is what helps you solve the coordination problem i mean you know if you uh, go back i'm old enough to remember you know when this development literature was coming through and we had this uh, literature 
uh, 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 same kind of issue, but in terms of balanced and unbalanced growth. Yeah. Uh, 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 and, and balanced growth guy saying that. So there was always worried about the demand side of it and all. Uh, uh, very much Rosenstein, Ronan style that look, you know, if you do certain activities all together, then, then uh, uh, there is demand, therefore, for each other, right? You know, if you do a big shoe factory in a closed economy, uh, then uh, uh, you will pay these workers higher wages than what you are paying them in agriculture. Uh, but what are these higher? What are these workers going to spend these higher wages on? Because they can buy only uh, a, a small fraction of the shoes that they are producing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, if you could make a massive investment and invest simultaneously in shoes, clothing, uh, 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 um, other consumer products. Uh, then they will have demand for each other's products and therefore they will clear the market. That was Rosenstein Ronald's original argument. Uh, but, uh, you know, but, and, and obviously it's assuming the existence of very uh, large scale economies so that, you know, each of these activities has to be done on a certain scale. Yeah. Because if they run on scale economies, then there is no reason, I mean, any, any entrepreneur could come in and produce because production costs are constant. So you can produce all these different products in one, uh, one entrepreneur could do it uh, and have a diversified basket of production. Yeah. And so it will automatically market will solve the problem. Today, in any case, with very large investors available, you know, the, 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 the big business houses, uh, even in the Indian context, like the, the Ambani's and the Tata's, et cetera, very big business houses. So they can actually solve the coordination problem, right? I mean, uh, in their context, for example, you want to produce an automobile. Uh, now you need the auto parts and you need all sorts of other ancillary uh, products uh, which uh, uh, contribute to the manufacturing of the automobile. Of course, if trade is possible, then in any case, you can import these. But even if trade is not possible, you know, they, buy, they get a, a piece of land which is 100 acres. And then they put up everything that they need in one place. So they managed to today, large investors can solve that problem. <laughs> but, you so, know, I have a more fundamental question here. Adam Smith, very early on in the Wealth of Nations, right? He tells us that the division of labor and the degree of specialization is going to be limited by the size of the market, right? So when he starts talking about the division of labor in the pin factory, He's very clear that people are going to dedicate themselves to pulling out the wire in a pin factory 12 hours a day, day after day, and engage in that kind of division of labor and specialization only if they are able to purchase everything else that they need, right? So if they can't, you're not going to get that kind of division of labor. So in the Smithian open economy free trade model, you will get a lot of diversification if the trade is very limited, right? Yeah. Uh, that is, each person needs to produce multiple things and coordinate. Uh, if the trade is relatively frictionless, open, and the size of the market is large, then you can get very high degrees of specialization. So to me, it seems like it's endogenous to the model, right? Uh, there isn't uh, an exogenous quantity of optimal specialization in any economy uh, and therefore coordination, right? Uh, the assumption is I'm going to spend all my time making toothpaste only if I'm confident that we can purchase toothbrushes, right? Otherwise, the toothpaste won't be forthcoming in the first place. What am I missing uh, in this kind of Adam Smith, you know, free trade, which endogenizes the degree of division of labor and specialization vis-a-vis -vis these models that you just talked about, where we're talking about coordination failures, which need to be engineered. I, I just don't understand why. So maybe I'm missing some step or some assumption. Yeah, no, I think, you know, basic point comes across in what you're saying, right? That, you know, if I'm an open economy, then in fact, I don't need to coordinate. Uh, and I, in fact, want to specialize. I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, and particularly if I'm uh, and not only uh, um, uh, open, but I'm also relatively small, right? And, and every developing country, no matter population-wise, how large, whether it was India or China in it's the 1950s, 
it's a very small economy. I mean, if you look at till 1980 or so, or uh, uh, the, the GDP in India was smaller than the GDP in South Korea. Yeah. And we used to sort of, you know, smugly talk about South Korea as being uh, quite small relative to us. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the GDP of South Korea exceeded our GDP. Today, things yeah. have changed, you know, after we opened up and also started growing. So uh, uh, really, uh, 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 if, if you're a relatively small economy, which, as I said, all developing countries are when they start off, uh, then uh, you don't want to carry, <laughs> undertake too many activities precisely for the reasons that Adam Smith very clearly laid out that, you know, you want to take advantage of the specialization process uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, import what uh, uh, inputs you don't produce. Uh, and and it, it is that is what really even allows you to begin to industrialize, right? You yeah. know, if you're starting with assembly activities, then you can import components and, yeah. and still assemble and, and get going. So, uh, so absolutely, you know. So this coordination argument uh, is very strictly, look, I mean, you know, it's not a, a, a coincidence that uh, Rosenstein Ronan was the one who kind of first uh, wrote it out because he was a Polish economist. These are closed economies. These are so, centrally and, planned economies. So he, exactly. So he where now, like, instead of the market process, you need an engineered process to do everything that the market would have naturally done, yeah. uh, endogenizing the solution right. to most of the problems that they've right. highlighted. Right, right, right. So, so this is actually, as far as protectionism is concerned, this is the weakest argument. In fact, okay. it's not even an argument, really. You know, because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy we still went over it, even though it doesn't have much merit in the literature. Because my problem with protectionism is these arguments never seem to go away. You know, every decade, they come back in some random, you know, completely made up context in some industry gathering or some op-ed article. And then everyone is gaga and say, yes, yeah. we are normally all for free trade, but for the purpose of diversification or for the purpose of coordination, you know, now we need some kind of intervention. Yeah. I mean, you know, Actually, so this is a good point uh, to set up our next conversation, which we will start talking about India finally. Yes. You know, I yes. think uh, you've been very patient with us in explaining and laying the ground for arguments in favor of free trade and sort of uh, walking us through the merits, uh, mostly demerits of arguments in favor of protectionism. So starting in the next episode, it'll be great if we can now focus on Indian political economy and the history of Indian protectionism, uh, you know, starting in colonial times and then continuing through Indian socialism and then, of course, the liberalization. So hopefully we can continue this conversation in that direction and also touch upon the more recent reforms that you just mentioned. We shall do that. We shall do that. Yes. Thank you so much as always, Arvind.